in designing sufficient electrical power must be provided to the building and at least one electrical outlet for every wall and more for special purpose rooms. You can never have too much conduit for communication cables. You must anticipate telephone, computer, and television connections. Make sure you have access to locations within a building, not just to the building. Another category of functions is being called managerial, for want of a better term. The acquisition and distribution of equipment and media is included in this term when it involves the actual physical moving of the items rather than electronic distribution. In many instances, technologies such as slide projectors and overhead projectors are still very useful. It may be desirable to provide your own collection of media resources, such as a library of films, videotapes, CD-ROMs, and video discs. It might be advantageous to locate a rental library of such materials that can be accessed when an item will be used only rarely. The consulting function relates to teaching and learning. Teaching and learning issues might be how to use media effectively in a board of directors conference room, or how to design a course using multimedia presentations along with computer conferencing. One area in which almost all instructors need assistance is in testing student performance. Consulting would also likely include providing leadership to development of new courses and working with instructors in the design of instruction. The most important component of a technology support group is people. What kind of people does a technology support group need? And what are the relationships among them? How are people motivated to learn the new skills required in a field of rapidly changing technology? The number and types of people needed depends upon what they are expected to do and also how many clients they're expected to serve. A staffing pattern that I would recommend for a starting point is shown in this chart. The chart shows that you can start off with a fairly small number of people, but that each one must have particular skills to offer. You need one professional level person to provide vision and leadership. And that person could also be a media designer. Beyond that, I would recommend one technical, one creative, and one clerical who could also assist with operations if needed. If you are only expecting this group to support distance learning, you would probably want more emphasis on the technical side. The number of staff may seem small related to the number of people to be served, but remember, some instructors will not use the services at all, and most will use the services only occasionally. The Media Technology Services Support Group at San Diego State University consists of 31 positions, of which three are administrative, three clerical, 12 technical. Of these, four are in operations and eight are in systems design maintenance and repair. A total of nine are in media production, with three each in TV production, graphics, and photography, and four are consultants. There is also on campus a separate computer support group of similar size. These groups serve a full-time equivalent faculty of about 1,400 persons, a ratio of about 1 to 23. A common characteristic that all the people of this support group share is a strong commitment to service. The instructional technology staff needs opportunities for learning new skills as technology changes. Some cross-training of staff may also be desirable. For example, photographers trained to be TV camera persons or graphic artists and TV producers working together so that they all become multimedia producers. Another central characteristic of the support group is facilities. 
facilities needed included building space, transportation, communications links, and computing. The specific facilities needed will depend upon the functions of the support group. Will you be doing TV production? If so, a studio and post-production facility may be required. However, you may decide to go to desktop video production. All shooting will be treated as location shooting, and all special effects will be generated in the multimedia room using a device such as the TV toaster with an Amiga computer. If you decide to use this approach to TV, your facility's requirements are much different. Transportation will be needed for shooting TV on location, for delivering items if required, and for getting around to maintain and repair systems. Another facility of the support group is the capability to access information and to make clients accessible to you. Access includes making as many sources of instructional technology available to the group's clients as possible. Included are such items as connections, networks, display devices, receivers, scheduling, delivering, and electronic storage. Consideration must also be given to accessing clients or customers to give them information from us, an information channel on closed circuit television, email and voicemail are paperless ways to accomplish this. Of course, paper bulletins and flyers are still effective means of communicating, but electronic and digital are the key words right now in this dynamic area of technology. A computing facility is also essential for the up to date instructional technology support group. Schedules, financial accounts, multimedia development, graphics, and word processing are all computer based activities of the group. A facility where instructors can access a wide variety of computing technology and highly skilled consulting has been one of the most popular services offered by the support group at San Diego State University. And finally, let's look at a consideration which is extremely important in the success of a technology support group. One of the great challenges of managing an ongoing instructional technology program is how to keep up with changes in technology. We have come a long way from the technical level shown in this picture entitled The Complete AV Director 1907. The concern I want to address is more than a concern about keeping up with changes in computer software or of going from a Macintosh 2 to Unix. You have to expect and not be overly concerned that as soon as you buy a new technology system, there's something better on the market. Those kinds of changes simply require that you choose equipment that will meet your needs for at least five years and move on to the next generation after that. There is no way to keep 100% state of the art unless you have an unlimited budget. The real challenge is in having to decide to reduce or eliminate an entire activity in order to move into a new activity. If additional resources are not made available, we must be willing to stop doing some things in order to take on new tasks. These can be very difficult but very necessary decisions. An instructional technology group begins from a vision. It is a vision of supporting the teaching learning process with technology systems. These systems are de designed to meet specific instructional goals. Planning and managing instructional technology services requires a clear sense of purpose and a commitment to the vision and goals of the organization. Managing instructional technology requires providing a level of support and respect to the staff which results in job satisfaction. Many of our clients express surprise that the staff of a support group can have such high morale and reflect a high commitment to service even in times when budgets are being reduced. And each person may have to adjust to a broader range of tasks. I'm convinced they are able to do this because they know the importance of their jobs and they realize that the better they do those jobs, the more they will be appreciated. The more they are appreciated, the greater their job satisfaction. 
participating in an instructional technology support group is not a prestigious or glamorous activity, but is one in which the participants must get most of their job satisfaction from the successes of those they serve. Thank you, Dr. Broderick. Telecommunications, as he has so clearly shown, is a collaborative art. You cannot create or manage a telecommunications application alone. Team building is very important, whatever the telecommunication goals and media. Great books may have been written by a single author working alone, but telecommunications for education and training requires collaboration of teachers, engineers, managers, and students. Electronic media, much more than print media, are social and collective enterprises calling for people skills, technical skills, and educational design skills. Telecommunication demands the best of talented people. The results can vastly improve the effectiveness and productivity of an organization and its individuals. Of course, we all know that a poorly designed telecommunication system created by people inadequately prepared or by people refusing to work cooperatively can waste great amounts of money and many people's time. Telecommunications can be very expensive with elaborate and highly complex technologies. Deficiencies at any stage, creative, technical, managing, or consulting, can undermine the effectiveness of the telecommunication application. A well-designed system, on the other hand, can improve many outcomes from student satisfaction to organizational efficiency to global competitiveness. Our second presenter, Dr. Bernie Dodge, specializes in flexible and well-targeted adaptations of computer potential to learning situations. Computer-based training, like satellite education, has dramatically improved since its earliest applications. Here is Dr. Dodge. These are exciting times for anyone who works with technology, particularly educational technology. Computers continue to become smaller, faster, and cheaper. CD-ROM technology makes it possible to carry an encyclopedia in your pocket. Telecommunications technology enables us to link learners with teachers, references, and other learners, regardless of distance. As the hardware has been developing, the soft technology of instructional design has been progressing as well. Recent advances in our understanding of the psychology of learning have made us smarter about how we put all this hardware to good use in education. The focus of this segment of the teleconference is CBT, computer-based training. A few minutes from now, you'll be able to answer these two questions. One, how have computers been used traditionally in training? And two, what new forms of computer-based training are coming into use? That second question is the more important of the two, and we'll spend most of our time on that. But let's begin with tradition. The use of computers in education and training is only a few decades old, but already the field has traditions. In the 60s, projects such as Plato and Ticket made use of mainframe and mini computers as a way to individualize instruction. Students logged onto a large shared computer and were presented with a lesson that was usually part of a sequence of lessons. The system would present small chunks of information, ask the learner a question, and either go on to present new information or go back, depending on the accuracy of the learner's response. The underlying goal of such systems was to replace human teachers. The lessons were self-contained and complete. All the information needed to meet the objectives of the lesson was contained in the program, and all the learner had to do was to assimilate it. It's as if the content to be learned was a jigsaw puzzle that was already put together for the learner. The job of the program was to transfer that fully assembled version of the content into the mind of the learner with every piece in place. Of course, you don't need a computer to teach this way. Many teachers work on the assumption that their job is to convey as efficiently and perfectly as possible their model of how the subject matter hangs together. And for some situations, that's completely appropriate. 
Let's have a look at what traditional computer-based training looks like. Imagine that this is part of a lesson on world economics. In the earlier screens of the lesson, the history and composition of OPEC has been described, and now the program is ready to test our knowledge. On a screen like this, we could click on any country and receive immediate feedback on the accuracy of our response. Click on Saudi Arabia, for example, and the program tells us we're correct. Click on Ethiopia, and it tells us there's no oil there to speak of. Now, after using a program like this for a while, a learner would be able to describe OPEC and its member countries with ease. Now, I've been speaking about traditional computer-based training as if it were a thing of the past, but is it? Is it a dinosaur compared to newer technologies? Not at all. Traditional CBT works well in teaching basic skills like grammar and arithmetic. It's also appropriate where there are strict rules or procedures that must be committed to memory, as you would find in safety training, for example. When the content that you're teaching changes slowly or not at all, traditional CBT will work well. Product knowledge, that is, being able to describe a company's line of products in detail without hesitation, is another possible application for traditional computer-based training. Well, if traditional CBT is so widely useful, what are its limits? Why would we want to consider going beyond the traditional? Traditional CBT and traditional teaching by humans would be all we'd need if we lived in a simple world that didn't change. But that isn't how things are, of course. The skills we need to perform at work, the jobs we do, the knowledge we need, all of these things are changing at an ever faster rate. The model of education as the transfer of content from one mind into another doesn't work as well when the content is always in flux. Instead, we need to train workers and ourselves to deal well with new situations, to untangle ambiguity, to look for patterns and trends, to gather and hear the opinions of others, to build consensus, to make inferences. In short, we need to teach people how to think better and to work together well. One approach to education that is taking root in North American education is called constructivism. In many ways, constructivism is an old idea. It advocates active learning rather than thinking of the learner's mind as just an empty box to be filled. It encourages us to teach by giving learners real tasks to do with real materials and problems rather than problems that are contrived and oversimplified. Constructivists assume that much of our knowledge is built when we work together in groups, thinking out loud and modifying each other's understanding. To a constructivist, learning is about making sense of information, making it meaningful, and not about simply receiving information and remembering it. So how would you implement a constructivist approach to computer-based training? First of all, the basic skill, the basic goal of such an approach is not knowledge transfer, but knowledge construction. Let's go back to the jigsaw puzzle metaphor. A constructivist would deliberately leave some of the information out of the program and instead leave obvious gaps which must be filled in in some way. What the learner receives is an incomplete picture that raises questions, arouses curiosity, creates a need to know more. The missing pieces needed for the learner to make sense of the content are somewhere else, probably somewhere away from the computer. Designing CBT with this approach, then, means designing a whole system which includes the software, other information sources, the learner's own prior knowledge, and knowledge provided by other learners working collaboratively. Instead of putting everything that is to be learned into the software, neatly structured and sequenced, information is deliberately spread around. The purpose for doing this is to more actively engage the learner in the process and to provide practice at learning how to learn. Traditional computer-based training breaks down fairly cleanly into categories of tutorials, drill and practice, and simulation. The new approaches to teaching with technology are too new to have settled into a simple set of categories. There are at least three categories, though, that we can look at, which serve as examples of the new approach. They are, one, authoring tools for learners, two, constructivist simulations, and three, performance support tools. Authoring tools have been around for as long as computers have been used in education. 
An authoring tool is software that allows one to create a program in a particular format without having to learn how to program. Educational authoring tools are traditionally used by teachers, trainers, and instructional designers to create traditional tutorials and drills. When used this way, authoring tools are used to capture and organize knowledge and put it into a form for easy transfer into the minds of learners. In this diagram, the process goes from left to right, from raw data at one end and a receptive learner at the other. Well, what would happen, though, if we turned that process around? What if what we required was that the learners go out and find and organize information and then use an authoring tool themselves to create software in a particular format? That software could then be viewed and played by others whose presence would provide an audience for the learner's work. This time, the process goes from right to left, and the meaningful, challenging work is done by the learners themselves. For four years here in San Diego, we've been experimenting with a tool called Cabrillo. Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo was the first European to cite San Diego, and this program was named after him because it's a tool for creating environments to be explored. Cabrillo was developed for use by seventh grade students. Prior to sitting down at the computer, the students studied one of five places in history between the years 800 and 1500 AD. They worked in groups to learn everything they could about Mexico during the time of the Aztecs, for example, and then used Cabrillo to create an adventure game. Each group consisted of five learners, each of whom had a specific responsibility. One gathered images to be put into the program. Another wrote the text of the story. Each student worked with his or her counterpart in the other groups to ensure that the writing was consistent and the graphics had a common look. Once they had drafted a map of the part of the world they wanted to create and had written a story and decided on the obstacles they wanted to put in the way of the player, they were given the Cabrillo tool to use. The tool provides a large part of the screen in which to draw images, and another part below it in which to write text. It also allows them to link any screen to any other without any knowledge of programming required. Here's a sample screen of the end result. It tells the story of a man called Mixedly, who had to sell himself into slavery to pay off his gambling debts. To wander around in the world created by these students you simply click on a direction on the compass. By overcoming obstacles and finding facts, you bring the story to a successful conclusion and bring Mixley out of slavery. So what did the students learn by going through this process? They were motivated to gather and organize a large amount of information about Teotihuacan. They learned to work and create together, to generate questions and find answers to them in the library. The computer served not as the source of information, but as the repository of it. The tool was designed to invite the creativity and curiosity of the learners, and it seems to have succeeded at that. Now, how can we apply the same structure to the training of adults? There are as many answers to that as there are authoring tools. There is software, for example, that allows one to create branching stories that have a common starting point and then allow the reader to make decisions and affect the plot. What would happen if you placed such software in the hands of those learning management skills, for example? You could provide them with a management problem which is ambiguous and information rich and which requires a decision to be made. Working in groups, they could reason together to decide what the consequences of each decision would be and then use the tool to write the next part of the story. By continuing the process through several decisions, you'd be creating an environment in which causes and effects could be argued about and general principles of management would be discussed. In that discussion, which might take place away from the computer, complex learning would take place. The interactive story created in this way would also serve as a starting point for discussion by other learners in other groups. Traditional tools for creating drill and practice software could also be used by the learners themselves. Instead of lecturing from a large textbook or manual, one could hand it to the learners and ask them to write test questions that might be asked about the material. The process of generating questions and plausible wrong answers puts the responsibility of learning where it belongs, in the hands of the learners themselves. The questions created with an authoring system by the learners can be compiled 
and present it as a contest to the entire class. Badly worded questions or inaccurate feedback will become the subject of discussion among the group. In this way, misconceptions are surfaced and taken care of. Finally, dynamic models of a business or other process can be created by learners using software like Stella. With such modeling tools, one gathers information about the object to be studied and creates equations or graphs relating one variable to another. The end result is a dynamic model which can be run, studied, and critiqued. The understanding that comes from creating such models is certain to be deeper than what comes from merely reading about the same topic. The second major category of new forms of computer-based training is the constructivist simulation. Such simulations put the learner in a realistic context, a context that would be difficult, dangerous, or expensive to bring into the classroom in any other way. The simulation provides a rich pool of loosely structured information, and the task of the learners is to make sense of it all. A good example of a constructivist simulation is the archetype program developed at the Dalton School, a private institution in New York City. Archetype is a simulation of an archaeological dig site. It contains images of helmets, coins, statues, pottery, all the various kinds of artifacts one might find in such a place. The learner's task is to describe the artifacts they find, observing in detail each feature and comparing it to other artifacts they might find in the simulated museum part of the program or in reference books. The overall goal is to make sense of what they find. Here's a short view of the project taken from a video produced by Apple Computer. For an archaeologist, there's nothing more exciting than, than digging. You're, you're looking for possible answers, and the excitement and the interest is in, in finding those possible answers and sharing those answers and those experiences with fellow workers. Our belief is that you have to trust students with the artifacts of the past and give them the task of attempting to make sense of it. So that the archetype program, for instance, is really based in the notion that if you give children access to the artifacts of ancient Greece or the artifacts of ancient Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt, that they will, in fact, be able to reconstruct a historical narrative of their own. Well, what we're doing is simulation, and we're mapping our artifacts and the wall we found on this grid so that if, if we find something that relates to another artifact, we can go back, look at the map, say, hey, this bell looks like another one we found. In learning about the past, or learning about any phenomenon, one doesn't look at a single attribute or single artifact. One has to amass a number of objects and make inferences of those and construct a database. Well, we have to um, dig up every single place. And that takes a long time, considering that we find a lot of artifacts. We're trying to figure out what happened here, what this whole place is. And we're trying to date it. But we think it's in the late 8th century because we found a Neo-Hittite helmet that came from the late 8th century. And it was made of bronze. I can decide what culture I want to use, uh, what aspects of the culture I want represented in the archaeological record. And then the students can go from there. And even though the students realize it is a simulation, it has been constructed as an educational tool, it becomes real to them. There might have been kind of a headquarters for the, um, the commanders and chiefs, which was right here. And our site, if you look at it, there's a thing that Kim thinks is an altar. And there was like a guard tower over here. A lot of times in Greek mythology, gods are symbolized as animals. And this over here was where they kept their prisoners. If I had lectured on well, three weeks or six weeks on a series, the students would have never remembered more than a fraction of what I had told them. The fear is always that we're going to lose the kids to this tunnel vision, this locked-in vision into, the, into the, another TV tube. And we find that when we're most successful in deploying the technology in a classroom, the kids are actually away from the computer more than they're at the computer. If you go in there on a typical day, there's probably half or a third of the class in there. The rest of the kids have fanned out throughout the school to go find things that are necessary for their investigation. So what are the important features to notice about archetype? First, that much of the learning took place away from the computer. 
Second, that the teacher wasn't the center of attention in the classroom, but instead served as a facilitator and guide. And third, that the learners were thinking out loud, making guesses and defending them. The technology was a catalyst in this case, which turned what could have been a conventional classroom into an environment in which learners generated their own questions and were compelled to find answers to them. How can these notions be applied to the training of adults? Imagine that instead of using a database of ancient artifacts, that learners were searching through a database of reported manufacturing defects or a data bank of accident reports. Imagine also that the learners would have access to other employees in the business to ask questions of and that manuals and other documents were also available as references. Or imagine an inbox simulation in which the computer shows an image of a desktop with a telephone, piles of memoranda, and a file cabinet full of correspondence and reports. Perhaps by clicking on the name of someone in a simulated office directory, one could access digitized video interviews with those individuals. By simulating the office or factory environment, one is using authentic materials and giving learners authentic tasks to complete. The learning that takes place under these conditions is likely to transfer well to performance on the job. The third and final category of the new CBT types to be examined here is the electronic performance support tool, sometimes referred to as an electronic performance support system, or EPSS. Such tools are designed to help workers perform a specific task or set of tasks. Some of the expertise required by these tasks is available online in a variety of ways, either as references or in the form of advice. Performance support tools form a partnership with the user. By using such tools, one learns what they need to know, when they need to know it. Over time, the learner internalizes the expertise contained in the tool and develops expertise of his own. An example of a performance support tool is Planalist. This tool is designed to help teachers and trainers create lesson plans, a task that many would rather avoid. Built into the tool is a database of teaching strategies which can be called upon at any time. There's also an expert system which can look at drafts of a lesson plan and provide feedback to the user. Here's a sample screen from the software. It provides a space in which the user can describe an activity that will take place at some point in the lesson. There's a place in which the length of time the activity will take can be estimated, and any media used can be specified. A database of 73 teaching strategies can be accessed for each activity, which in a subtle way encourages the user to justify every minute being spent in the lesson. In this case, the activity is being defined as a motivational technique designed to arouse uncertainty. Once a lesson has been drafted, the software looks at the lesson plan and evaluates it based on a set of decision rules. In this screen, the built-in expert system has pointed out that the lesson has a long stretch of time in which information is being presented with no practice time for the learners. It suggests breaking up the lesson into smaller chunks. A novice teacher or trainer learns in a fairly short time how to create lesson plans that gain the approval of the expert system, and in so doing, the user is learning on the job in a way that is tied directly to his or her needs at the moment. There's no artificial separation between working and learning. The two blend completely. The use of performance support systems is growing. There are systems available for helping loan officers decide how much money to loan a given customer while considering complex issues of risk and reward. Others are designed to help those who provide technical support by telephone. The systems guide the user through a set of diagnostic questions leading to probable solutions. Still other performance support systems walk the user through the process of creating a business plan, providing examples of each section on request. 